Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Uh, this session is again a quick recap in anatomy, especially embryology, systemic embryology. And uh, we are here with the development of cardiovascular system. So cardiovascular system again, I've done a lot of videos in a detailed version. So this is just a quick recap. So please don't expect a detailed version here. I will be just uh, mentioning the important uh, structures contributing to each and we will just rush through the uh, MCQ. So if you have to uh, understand it in a better way, always see the sessions which I have done previously, then have a quick review here. So we will start. Uh, so early nutrition to the embryo, that is at the morula stage, it uh, gets its nutrition from the cytoplasm of the ovum. In the blastocyst stage, it uh, derives its nutrition from the uterine gland secretions. And uh, during implantation, uh, it gets nutrition from the maternal blood. And later stages, it is taken over by the placenta. And after that, further nutrition uh, and nourishment is derived from the extraembryonic and intraembryonic vessels. So match the following, uh, we have the three main vessels, white line veins, umbilical veins, common cardinal veins. So let's see from which all regions you get these veins. So you have the white line veins from the umbilical vesicle, uh, the umbilical veins from the chorion and common cardinal veins from the body wall. So the white line veins carry poorly oxygenated blood that is from the umbilical vesicle, umbilical veins they are the ones which are carrying well oxygenated blood from the chorion that is from the, through the placenta. Now you have the common cardinal veins which again receive poorly oxygenated blood from the rest of the body of the embryo. So when we talk about the definitive heart, uh, it is derived from two endothelial heart tubes. So the endocardium is derived from the endothelial heart tube the lining, then you have the myocardium from the surrounding splanchnic mesoderm and the epicardium from the mesothelial cells of the sinus venosus. And when we imagine a heart tube, we have a cranial end as well as a caudal end. Cranial end is the arterial end bulbous cardus and the caudal end is the venous end, we call it as sinus venosus. So all are parts of heart tube except bulbous cardus, primitive atrium, sinus venosus, dorsal iota. Bulbous cordis and sinus venosus, we just mentioned it as the uh, cranial and caudal end. Primitive atrium, of course, it should be there in the heart tube. So, it's not the dorsal iota which is lying outside. So, heart tube presents four dilatations from cranial to caudal end. The first one is bulbous cordis, then we have the primitive ventricle, primitive atrium and the sinus venosus. So, this is just a schematic representation. We have the bulbous cordis, primitive ventricle, primitive atrium and sinus venosus. Now you can see that uh, the truncus arteriosus is the part which is giving rise to the aorta and pulmonary arteries. Then uh, you have the cornus cordis, the second part of the bulbous cordis which is giving rise to the outflow tract of both ventricles. Then you have the trabeculated inflow part of the right ventricle from the proximal portion of the bulbous cordis. So these are the three derivatives of the bulbous cordis. Then uh, you have the primitive ventricle and primitive atrium. So between the bulbous cordis and the primitive ventricle, you can see the bulboventricular sulcus and that is the portion where you get the interventricular foramen. So the right ventricle is derived from the proximal portion of the bulbous cordis whereas uh, the left ventricle is actually formed from the primitive ventricle. Now the primitive heart starts beating by the uh, by the 22nd day and circulation of blood is established by 24th day. Now the outflow tract of ventricles arise from, it is from the cornus cordis. Now ha have you heard about a term known as bulboventricular loop because uh, the thing is the cavity remains the same whereas the heart tube elongates. So what happens there would be enough space to accommodate this elongated heart tube within the chamber. So it has to bend on itself. Such a loop is known as bulboventricular loop. So it is between the bulbous cordis and the ventricle. That is the reason why it is known as bulboventricular loop. And it is suspended by the dorsal mesocardium. And if it, when it degenerates, there you have the transverse pericardial sinus, which connects the two pericardial chambers on right and left. Then uh, the specification of the structures in the cardiac tube is actually determined by the retinoic acid secreted by the mesoderm. 
that is the reason why uh, uh, if there is an excess or a deficient of retinoic acid it can produce a variety of cardiac defects if it is administered from external aspect so this is the transverse pericardial sinus now the sinus venosus that is the venous end there you can see the three sets of veins the white line veins you have the umbilical veins and then you have the common cardinal vein which divides into anterior and posterior cardinal veins so these are the three sets of veins which are opening into the sinus venosus now let's see what are the changes happening the left vital line vein regresses okay and the right white line vein forms the hepatic portal system and the inferior vena cava a portion of the inferior vena cava so again uh, the development of portal system i have done in detail please go and watch that session uh, now uh, let's see the remaining you can see uh, the supra cardinal veins and sub cardinal veins okay the superior vena cava is actually formed from the common cardinal vein then you have the remaining veins Let's see what are the fates, supracardinal vein and subcardinal vein, which are the structures derived from these cardinal veins. We have the azagos and hemiazygos vein and along with the inferior part of inferior vena cava, that is from the right supracardinal vein. Whereas the subcardinal vein gives rise to the left renal vein, suprarenal veins, gonadal veins, that is the testicular and ovarian veins and a part of inferior vena cava. So this why I am mentioning is this will be useful for you to solve most of the MCQs. So this is the supracardinal vein and this these are the subcardinal veins. So the supracardinal veins see you will get questions like this supracardinal veins form all except except the suprarenal veins they are formed from the subcardinal veins. Now inferior vena cava again you need to know which are the structures from which it is derived. It is derived from the right vital line vein, right supracardinal vein, right subcardinal vein and the subcardinal supracardinal anastomosis. I will be doing a session in detail about the development of superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. Many of you have asked but for the time being you just know the derivatives. IVC or inferior vena cava is formed from all except, all except right umbilical vein. We just mentioned the derivatives. Now uh, there is a valve known as sinoatrial valve, SA valve, that is the opening of the sinus venosus into the atrium. So this is the sinoatrial orifice which is guarded by the sinoatrial valve and it is attached to uh, the atrium through septum spurium. Now let's see what are uh, the uh, valves getting transformed into. You have the right valve here and you have the left, left valve of the sinoatrial orifice here. So the right valve is actually forming the crista terminalis along with the valve of inferior vena cava and valve of coronary sinus. Whereas the left valve is getting attached or it merges with the septum secundum. So that is what is happening to the valves of the sinoatrial orifice. You can see the crista terminalis, valve of inferior vena cava and valve of coronary sinus. Now interatrial septum, again I have done a detailed version for the same. You can see the septum primum which is formed first and you can see a foramen here that is the ostium secundum. Ostium primum will be here and this is the ostium secundum. Now later what happens is this will be covered by a septum secundum and you have the foramen ovale which is the connection between right atrium and left atrium and after birth the septum secundum and primum will get fused so that there won't be any passage. So this depression which is seen from the right atrium, this depression is known as fossa ovalis. So it is actually overlying the septum primum and this uh, border for the fossa ovalis from above that is known as limbus fossa ovalis which is actually a part of septum secundum. I have done a detailed version, please go and see. So septum primum is for, uh, giving the fossa for, for ovalis and the limbus of fossa ovalis is formed by septum secundum. Septum ovalis, is, uh, fossa ovalis is the remnant of septum primum. Now interventricular septum has got three components. One is the muscular portion from the ventricular wall, then you have the membranous portion from the endocardial cushions and then you have the bulba part which is from the spiral septum. So this is a muscular, then you have the bulba portion and this is the membranous part. So uh, we will get uh, defects, ventricular septal defects due to any defect in these uh, portions. 
Now, aortic arches, again, I've done a detailed session. I, uh, we know there are mainly six aortic arches and which later regresses. And let's see the important structures derived from it. I'm not going to the details here. So you have three, four and six, the important ones which are giving rise to the important vessels. So let's see the third arch, fourth arch and sixth arch. Third arch is giving rise to the common carotid arteries right and left. Fourth arch on the left side, it is giving rise to the arch of aorta. On the right side, it is giving rise to subclavian artery. And sixth arch on the left, the left pulmonary artery. And on the right, the right pulmonary artery. And you have the ductus arteriosus connecting the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So this is just uh, the most important part of the aortic arch. The detail which I have done already. So this you should know in order to uh, crack the MCQs. Now, this is a fetal circulation, the comparison between the fetal circulation and adult circulation and let's see what are the changes happening to the structures which were there in the fetus and uh, what happened to those structures in the adult. So we can see uh, the umbilical vein here which is not there in the adult which is transformed into ligamentum teres hepatis. Then uh, the second structure you have the ductus venosus which is converted here as ligamentum venosum. Then you have uh, the foramen ovale which is closed in adults that is if, if it is persistent then you call it as persistent foramen ovale or patent foramen ovale. Then uh, the next structure is ductus arteriosus in fetus which is getting converted as a just a ligament that is the ligamentum arteriosum. This connects the pulmonary artery and the aorta but here it is just seen as the ligament. And the last structure the umbilical arteries they are getting converted as medial umbilical ligament. So these are the major changes which is happening, which are happening to the structures of the fetus when it becomes an adult. Uh, so again, I have done a uh, detailed session on fetal circulation. Please watch. So uh, uh, the next question is axial artery. There are axial vessels for the uh, limb buds, both upper limb as well as lower limb. So let's see which is the axial artery of the upper limb, that is the anterior interosseous artery. So you should know which are the axial arteries of the upper limb and lower limb. So upper limb, uh, the code which I usually say is DABA, that is deep palmar arch, anterior interosseous artery, brachial artery, axillary artery. So uh, if you come from above, you have the axillary artery continuing as the brachial artery, then the anterior interosseous artery and deep palmar arch. They are the uh, arteries which go in one go. Then lower limb, IAP3, that is inferior gluteal, arterial nervi ischiatica, then popliteal artery, perineal artery, plantar arch. So this is the flow. So IAP3 is for the lower limb. Again, these axial arteries can be asked uh, here and there as uh, you know, to solve the MCQ. So you should know the important axial arteries of the upper limb as well as the lower limb. The next syndrome is known as halt arm syndrome, heart hand syndrome. Uh, it is an autosomal dominant disorder with atrial septal defects and along with that you will get preaxial or radial limb anomalies. Now, Talking about the atrial septal defects, there are mainly ostium secundum type and ostium primum type. Ostium secundum is said to be the most common type and ostium primum is mainly an endocardial cushion defect. So here you have the ostium primum and here you have the ostium secundum. So ostium primum defect and ostium secundum defect. Now there is a condition known as co-trilocular biventricular. There is complete absence of septum resulting in a single atrium. Co-trilocular means three chambers where you get two ventricles. So if there are three chambers, if there are two are ventricles, then you have only one atrium. That is the uh, way by which it is termed so co-trilocular by ventricular. Now we will move on to the Epstein anomaly. Uh, in the Epstein anomaly, we have the tricuspid valve, which is seen on the right side, displaced towards the apex of the right ventricle. Uh, this is the displacement, tricuspid valve displaced towards the apex of the uh, right ventricle and here the anterior leaflet will be enlarged. Then along with that you will get right atrium hypertrophy and you will also get uh, a septal defect, atrial septal defect uh, or it can present as patent for I mean, oval in 50 percentage of the cases. So this is a tricuspid valve, this is the hypertrophy of the right atrium and this is the place of atrial septal defect. 
Now, the next one is ventricular septal defect and it is said to be the most common congenital cardiac malformation and uh, the membranous part is said to be, the, a defect in the membranous part is said to be uh, the most common condition. Now, uh, then we will move on to the phallostate triology which include all except pulmonary stenosis, right ventricular hypertrophy, atrial septal defect. These are all are included in phallose triology uh, except the overriding of iota. So you should know what do you mean by phallose tetralogy. It includes ventricular septal defect, pulmonary stenosis, right ventricular hypertrophy and overriding of iota. These are the major four components of phallose tetralogy. And there is a condition known as tet spell where the affected when the affected babies cry or strain when there is undue strain they will just turn blue in color and they will be having associated difficulty in breathing and uh, sometimes they will cry and cry and they will lose consciousness as well. Now what do you mean by phallus pentrology? Pentology is tetralogy with atrial septal defect or patent for aminoid whereas triology is pulmonary stenosis, right ventricular hypertrophy and atrial septal defect. Now there is another condition known as common truncus arteriosus or persistent truncus arteriosus. Common truncus arteriosus means the trunk is common or persistent means the trunk is persistent and it is not dividing into two. That is the reason is because of the failure of the conotruncal ridges to develop so that it will separate it into pulmonary artery and iota. So if these ridges are failing to develop what will happen is there will be a common trunk for the iota and the pulmonary trunk and uh, since this ridge is contributing to the formation of the ventricular septum you will get an associated ventricular septal defect as well. Another condition is transposition of great vessels. Transposition means changing the position which, uh, which they are in the adult form. Suppose you have the pulmonary uh, artery and the iota. If the iota is arising from the left ventricle and the pulmonary artery from the right ventricle, in transposition means it will be just the opposite. That is iota will arise from the right ventricle and pulmonary artery will arise from the left ventricle. And that is because you have the conotruncal septum. That is actually a spiral septum which will decide uh, the opening of the iota and the pulmonary artery. If it, this septum is uh, forming a straight septum instead of the spiral septum, what happens is uh, this will just divide the uh, truncus arteriosus into two halves and one will lie on the uh, right side and one will lie on the left side if it is not forming a spiral septum. So, as a result what happens is iota will be arising from the right ventricle and pulmonary artery from the left ventricle. That condition is known as transposition of great vessels. Now there is another entity known as coarctation of iota or narrowing of the aortic lumen. So this is the narrowing of the aortic lumen. Uh, this can be classified into two types. You can see the ductus arteriosus and this is the ligamentum arteriosum. So if it happens before the ligamentum arteriosum, you can call it as preductal coarctation and if it is happening beyond the ductus arteriosum or ligamentum arteriosum, you call it as postductal coarctation and this is said to be more common type. So this is just a quick recap of the major events of the cardiovascular system for a detailed version. Please go and watch my channel. Thank you. Thanks for watching.